Thank you, Ben, uh, for that introduction. Um, uh, Jan said that this was the most buzzword bingo uh, title uh, of all the keynotes, but he said it was very keynotey as well uh, by having uh, maxed out on all the buzzwords. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you this very big picture um, uh, talk, but I'm, I'm also going to kind of spice it up with um, topics from my own lab, from research from my own lab. So just to introduce EMBL for you, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, we're Europe's only intergovernmental laboratory for life science research. Um, we have a sister, we're kind of sister to CERN in high energy physics, to ESO in astronomy, astronomy, the European Southern Observatory, and to ESA in space. We are the equivalent for molecular biology. And we were founded in 1974 to achieve five things, to perform excellent research, to deliver scientific services, so to enable science to happen across Europe, to do advanced training, which basically means PhD students and postdocs, to provide innovation and translation, so that means collaborating and working with companies, and to help integrate the life sciences across Europe. And we're still going strong today in the 2020s. Um, I appreciate that not everybody will no EMBL, though I hope most of you will use uh, the databases from EMBL EBI, for example, all the time. So we're headquartered in the beautiful town of Heidelberg, Germany. That's where our main labs are. And our second biggest site is at Hingston um, at EMBL EBI. And it's the same site as the Sanger Institute. And that's totally de dedicated to bioinformatics, to data. We also have two sites uh, adjacent to synchrotrons. If you were a group of structural biologists, you would know us because you would be visiting our synchrotrons regularly in Grenoble and in Hamburg, or the beam lines on our synchrotrons. And then the two latest sites are in Rome, focusing on epigenetics and neurobiology, and then Barcelona, which is on the bottom left here, which is uh, on the beach, absolutely beautiful uh, floor of this building, uh, focused on tissue biology. Um, we have a new Director General, Edith Hurd, and she has challenged us in a very productive way to keep one foot in our molecular and cellular um, understanding of life, and I'll talk a lot about that in a moment, but also to take a kind of stride out of the lab and think about life in context. So that means about thinking about organisms in their natural context, their environment, how organisms interact, and how organisms interact with the environment. Um, and that's been very stimulating and exciting, and it means that we're building new interfaces to epidemiologists and uh, ecologists, which I will mention uh, the epidemiologists later on. But I want to talk now about data science, and there was a wonderful um, review by Kim Naismith, um, from, who used to head up the IMP, the Institute of Molecular Pathology in, in uh, Vienna, and he was reflecting on the impact of Mendel, um, Mendel being uh, a German-speaking monk who spent his time in a monastery um, in the Czech Republic, quite close to Vienna, um, and of course was the founder of um, uh, genetics. And Kim made the point that Mendel is arguably the first data scientist in biology. So he's the first scientist who tabulated data um, to derive information or derive an understanding of life. And what he was tabulating was his beloved P's and uh, the number of phenotypes seen in the F0, F1, and F2 um, uh, um, generations. And he, um, uh, he didn't apply statistics. In fact, if you go back and you redo his tables, his data is slightly too good to be true, given the model that we now know that bears his name. Implies he was slightly cooking the books at some point um, in this, probably when he worked out what was going on. Um, but what he did do was derive an understanding, a model uh, of genetics, which we call Mendelian genetic genetics after him from that data. And there's an argument that we are still walking the same footsteps as Mendel now. So we we generate lots of data, which is observations about how living systems work. We provide 
we, we do statistics on this, and I've given lots of different names here, be it multivariate statistics, Bayesian statistics, deep learning, machine learning, they're all part of the same big family of how do you derive information out of data. And then we do that for two reasons. One is to gain understanding of the system. So in some sense, which models or what understanding, which models explain our data best. And the second thing, which doesn't have to be totally related to the first, is can we make accurate predictions? Can we predict what's going to happen in the future, even if we perhaps don't understand it fully? So I want to talk about how our science now has evolved from those uh, uh, 18, that 19th century, the 1860s kind of view. And we have been driven by increases in data gathering technology. So one of them has been around genomics, and these are the sele uh, selection of different ways we have measured or determined um, DNA polymers. On the left-hand side, I actually even did some of this, um, was this wonderful business of using dideoxy sequencing um, on a, a gel with you know, wonderfully massive amounts of radioactivity. It was great fun, um, uh, uh, where you expose the final thing on a film. That got automated in the 1990s, and then there's a series of technologies of which the most dominant one was developed in Cambridge, UK, Selexa, and then bought up by the company, the West Coast company, Illumina. And that has become the kind of uh, workhorse of the way we look at DNA uh, at the moment. It's still very similar in many ways to the dideoxy uh, termination. It's reversible dideoxy, reversible termination um, of um, uh, DNA synthesis. And then on the right-hand side, I've put two um, uh, of the newest types of ways of, of determining DNA sequence. So at the top is nanopores. This is very different, where you uh, let a nanopore go, uh, a DNA sequence go through a nanopore, and you record the ionic current coming um, due to the blockage of the DNA through the nanopore. Um, this had been known that DNA went through nanopores since the 1990s. The big problem actually wasn't um, how, how do you get DNA through nanopores, that was easy. It was how do you slow it down? How do you slow it down so you can measure things as the DNA gets through? So probably the most important thing in this uh, picture is actually the little circle, which is what's called the motor protein, which actually should be better called the break. And then the bottom one is uh, from PacBio. There's this rather charming uh, way they describe it. The only moving part in our machine is the polymerase. And so they have a fixed polymerase at the bottom of uh, uh, wells, and they synthesize DNA through that polymerase, and they use this quantum effect that if you pass a very high energy laser below the surface, um, only the fluorophores that are absolutely close to the surface will um, fluoresce through this quantum effect. Uh, and that's called a zero wavelength, um, sometimes zero wavelength uh, sensing. So I just want to give you a little view of how um, our ability to measure DNA has changed. And my animation has slightly gone wrong here. This should have been just started with one. So if we go straight up uh, at 12 o'clock here, the number of simultaneous molecules. When Fred Sanger first did this, this was one molecule almost at a time, or maybe as many as you could put on a gel. It now gets up to um, a billion molecules simultaneously. Um, then we get the length of the molecule, how long a molecule can you read. Now, very early uh, techniques were done in, in 200 and 500 base pair, as long as your gel was. In fact, with Selexa technology, that went down, and the lowest number of um, nucleotides I've analyzed in my life has been 19 base pairs, a collection of 19 base pair nucleotides. Um, and amazingly, you can do quite a lot with 19 base pair nucleotides if you have enough of them. Oxford Nanopore's longest read at the moment is four times 10 to the six. Four million bases have gone, gone consistently through one nanopore. Um, and those incredibly long, what's called ultra longs, give you a new view of the length that we can get. 
We can also measure many different types of molecule. I'm going to come on to this in a moment from work in my own group. And in particular, again, oxid nanopore can measure both DNA or RNA. So RNA being the related biopolymer molecular biology, they can directly read RNA as well as DNA. And in particular, both oxid nanopore and PAC bio can read methylation, so where the methyl sites are on the DNA. And for oxid nanopore, it can sense basically virtually any chemical modification, which I'll come on to in a moment. One of the very big drivers uh, for our technology is how much it costs, um, and it's a big trade-off. Um, and this has dropped remarkably a million, at least a million-fold um, over the last two decades, maybe up to 10, 100 million-fold. Um, and it's one of the technologies that's dropped the most in price um, uh, in uh, this century. Um, the error rate um, goes up and down. Um, the, most, um, the lowest error rate that I know of is uh, one in, in 10 to the 4 um, from PacBio. Um, and uh, some of the worst error rates um, presented um, have been in the 1 in 10. Um, and so that gives you from oxygen nanopore. And so there's a big spread of error rates, I should say. Oxygen nanopore's error rate has got a lot better, uh, but I'll note there that I am a consultant for oxygen nanopore. And then there's this business of all-in time to results. So how quickly can you go from a, from a, a sample um, or blood in the patient to a result in the computer? And that's varied from months now to hours um, and allows you to really do things which are time sensitive. That's less of a problem for research, but for clinical applications, that's obviously critical that you can bring the time down. Now, one aspect of this, rate, this sort of radar chart, there is nothing inherently uh, uh, in the biophysics that trades these things off. There's nothing that says that you, you, if you go up this axis, you must go down this axis. Um, all of these axes are broadly independent of each other. Um, and that is quite interesting. It means there's a, still a very bright future of improvement uh, that can happen for DNA measurement technologies. Now, I want to touch on one of these from um, uh, a gifted, very gifted postdoc in my group, Adrian Ledger. And he wanted to explore um, uh, how RNA modifications work. And RNA is a very complicated molecule in our cell, and it gets heavily modified. If you're from the protein world, this is a bit like phosphorylation. If you're from the DNA world, it's a bit like DNA methylation. But for both of them, it is far more diverse. There are many, many more types of RNA modification than there are protein modification or DNA modification. And so what, um, uh, one of the problems with this is not being able to train models because you don't have truth sets uh, for all the different combinations of modifications in all the different sequence contexts. Even generating a truth set is incredibly hard work uh, for RNA. And so Adrien took a very different approach. He looked at a native RNA to RNA where the modification has been removed, either by deletion uh, of or, or knockdown of a modifying enzyme, or later on what we've done is used in vitro um, transcription. So we've in vitro transcribed RNA as a reference, and then we look at, compare that to the native uh, RNA. Um, there are two features that change um, in uh, when a modified base goes through a nanopore uh, sequence. So one is the amplitude of the current, the picoamps, and the second one is the kinetics, how fast it moves. And the kinetics is driven by when the modification enters the motor as much as when the modification enters the pore. So there's two different points for the, um, for the uh, um, change in kinetics. And these are some of the multivariate plots shown here in panel B of modifications. And the two different um, uh, shapes here show that we can get separation in many sites between the modified and the unmodified um, DNA, uh, RNA, sorry. 
And on the top here, this shows a case in the top is the wild type aspect of an RNA that has three sites that are being modified, which are the rows. And then the bottom is the knockdown where a RNA uh, methylase has been knocked down. And the intensity is the deviation uh, of, um, or the placement in this multivariate space where darker means it's more likely to be modified. So you can see two things. Firstly, the knockdown has far less modification, though it's not complete. The knockdown only knocks down one of the enzymes, um, which is to do with M6A uh, methylation. But secondly, that the patterns here are complex. In other words, the different sites on the RNA are modified in different combinatorics. I think this is very exciting, and we're going to learn a lot more about RNA modifications and I think this will give us insight into likely RNA life cycle inside of the cytoplasm um, and in the cell. But going back to um, DNA sequencing, so what has all this DNA sequencing enabled? So one is the reference genome of many species. This is a lovely picture of the human genome printed out as books, which you can see in Euston Road um, uh, in London. Um, but um, there's an ambitious goal to sequence every species on the planet, and that is progressing, and that goes to the cheapness of these technologies at the moment. The second thing, which many people have talked about here already, and it will be talked about, I think, many times, is if you can take your molecular biology technique and you can make the readout being DNA, then suddenly you can scale. And so this is the whole set of da 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 seq analysis, RNA seq, chip seq, single cell seq, attack seq, all these other things. The basic theme here is using DNA as a readout of molecular biology that you do uh, in the cell. And the final thing is the integration into clinical practice for both rare disease, cancer, and infectious disease. So actually making a practical difference to people. I want to talk about another aspect here from my group. This is work by Tom Fitzgerald. This is looking at cop copy number variation. So one of the forms of variation between us is not single individual base pair differences, but large chunks of genome which are either duplicated or deleted relative to each other. This has been known about for a very, very long time. And it's been known about clinically and in terms of genetics but it was best summed up um, by Peter Donnelly when he says it's a bit like Vietnam, it's just a mess talking about the, um, uh, the um, <laughs> US uh, war in Vietnam uh, uh, of a uh, morass of um, 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 uh, very hard to achieve. And what Tom has done here is looked at um, uh, improving the way we do associations to copy number. And he has quite an interesting approach. He uses, for every sample, he uses 100 other samples um, that are closest in the DNA extraction and chromatin state. And this is a phenomenon that's been known about for some time, which is when you extract uh, DNA from blood from different individuals, they often have a sort of characteristic differential wave across the genome, somewhat associated to GC content and somewhat associated to chromosome bands. It's been a bit mysterious about why it's there. I can speculate why it, it's present. Um, but it's a real phenomenon that you can see in many, many, in all samples that you get from blood. And so what Tom does is he tries to find, for every individual sample that he's calling, he tries to find the 100 other closest samples with a matching genomic wave across the genome. And then he uses those 100 as the reference to call the sample that he's looking at in terms of its copy number variation. Now, on the right-hand side is a series of quality control charts from Tom. Um, I want you to focus on the top left, panel A which is the coverage on autosomes versus the coverage on chromosome X. So this is looking at the X chromosome copy number. 
The, this just comes straight out of Tom's algorithm. There's nothing else done. And what you can see is there's two very big populations. One is blue and one is pink. The blue are the males and the pinks are the females. Uh, and then we actually get some people who are in some other categories. So the red are um, double XYs uh, or triple Xs um, uh, going up. And the uh, blacks are people who have severe copy number deletions on the X chromosome, which is more, chromos which is more common um, than you might think. Now, that ability to create a robust measure of um, copy number variation um, has allowed Tom to do a variety of things. So this is just showing one particular picture on the top left-hand side of that copy number variation over, uh, over the genome. And on the right-hand side is looking at a particular locus in the UK biobank, uh, where zero here, which is in different places, but usually around the mode, is the reference point uh, from those 100 other references. And what Tom's showing here is some of the classic shapes. So the top right is a deletion where we get one, the major peak is over zero, the second peak is to the left. The next one is a duplication, there's a major peak over zero, and you can see there's a little bit of a smudge to the right. And then we get more complex features. Now one of the big problems about trying to use this data is you can see the shapes of these different um, alleles or loci are very, very different. So when we want to do statistical association with this, if you want to take this to a genotype perspective of the copy number, you need to decide how you model and then how you do the association. But Tom realized that, in fact, you could do the association of phenotypes to the linear measurement here. And that has two um, uh, great benefits. The first great benefit is that we don't have to call these complicated shapes into different spaces. So that's one thing. And the second is we have the same degrees of freedom across the entire genome. And so when we do the association study, we can do the same test in, many, in, in all the different loci across the genome. And this has allowed Tom to do the first systematic association of copy number variation to phenotypes in the UK biobank. And he can now characterize the way, for example, he finds many, many hits, by the way. Copy number is associated with lots and lots of different phenotypes but he can characterize those hits in a variety of ways, and this is perhaps the most, important, uh, the most useful one, which is to what extent is the copy number variation consistent with associations that you see from SNP chips. So the uh, just to explain the plots, um, what you can see here is on the bottom panel is the region of the genome. The next panel, the middle panel, is the association to SNPs and they're going to be colored by the R squared to the copy number variant. And the copy number variant is shown in the top panel, and the red dot is the called copy number that we're focusing on. So the far left example is an example where there's a copy number variant. It's extremely well tagged with a SNP, and this is exactly what you would expect. About 30% of the copy number associations fall into that. The next one is a case which is much more complicated where the copy number variant has tagging SNPs, but the top SNP that's associated with the same phenotype is at some distance from where the copy number variant is. So you would definitely call this as a locus uh, with an association from the SNP data but this copy number variant is suggesting at least a different causal mechanism in a different place than where the SNP, the highest SNP tag is. The third example, which is quite common, is a really extreme example of that, where on the top here you can see a very strong association to a copy number. On the bottom, there are many associations to the same phenotype across this locus but none of them explain the copy number. They're all blue in the bottom, uh, uh, in the middle panel there. Um, and that's a situation where it looks like the copy number is a different allele at the same locus, which is a different functional form of the genome at this point. This is actually the hair color locus, 
and this is doing association to um, hair color in UK uh, by a bank. And the final case is the case where the copy number variant makes an association, a strong association, and we have no tagging SNPs at all. Um, there, this would just simply would not have been picked up at all in a SNP case. And that is 17% uh, of this. It's quite an interesting question of how the right-hand situation arises. If you think about it, it can't be simple, because if this copy number occurred in the normal processes that we think about, there should be a tagging SNP somewhere, and it doesn't. Uh, we have many cases like this, and we think this, this must be due to something about the recurrence of copy number variation um, at the same point at the same locus. Now, we've done this on a number of other uh, cases, and I just want to give you a sneak preview into something that's cooking, which is to look at um, COVID cases using the Genomics England cohort that looked at mild COVID cases versus severe. This is the same, this is a Manhattan plot of the association to copy number. And what you can see is there are three massive peaks. Now, those three massive peaks, I mean, when Tom and I first saw that, we were like, yes, this is brilliant. Um, and then we looked at what was under the peaks, and they are the three T cell loci. And so we were like, ah, that's not very interesting. We know that T cells change a lot in the infection of, um, uh, uh, by COVID. And of course, COVID severe cases, by definition, are after they've had COVID. Um, so we can't use this, this correlation is really telling us something about how COVID, severe COVID works, not about the genetic risk to COVID. But actually, when you dig into this, it's much more interesting than that, because I, I did not appreciate this. There are two types of T cell, alpha beta T cells and gamma delta T cells. We've never really understood what gamma delta T cells do. And uh, this copy number change is driven by differential change between the proportion of alpha beta T cells and gamma delta T cells. And so there is something interesting here, and it tells you that blood DNA is also, in a very roundabout way, a complex way of typing, at the very least, alpha beta to gamma delta T cells. Um, and that will be an interesting thing for us to take back into other associations. So that was genomics. I'm going to very briefly touch on imaging. So imaging has exploded um, again over the last two decades. Now, we use the word microscope for all of these different things, like electron microscope and super-resolution microscope and other things. But it's really important to stress that what doesn't happen is that you, put, you use your eye, the human eye, as the data collection device. You do not put your eye in the way of an electron beam at the bottom of an electron microscope. And there's absolutely no way that your eye can sort out what happens in a super resolution microscope. And so these imaging technologies are, are very computational. They are, they are data collection devices that resolve things in X, Y, Z. And the data is then presented. And then eventually, we see a rendering, usually on a two-dimensional screen, of what we're looking at. We now have a range of different technologies that go from the atomic scale through to the organismal scale. And the goal here, ultimately, is to be able to stitch together almost atomic scale resolution imaging all the way up to organismal scale imaging. It is remarkable. And there's a whole set of different technologies that span this, and I'm going to highlight a number of them uh, coming up. So the first is um, electron uh, tomography, so um, electron microscopes. And this is uh, the very simple business of using uh, electrons as light. We've known about the ability to do this for a very, very long time. And you can do this on frozen samples, and you can tilt the sample which allows you from the same sample to get many, many different projections. From that tilted sample, you can often see things at molecular scale, I wouldn't say atomic scale. What is really interesting here is twofold. Firstly, you can do in situ, 
situ structural biology. So that is for molecules which are where you have enough of them in your cell, you can take a cell, freeze it, do this electron tomography, and then reconstruct the states of the molecule that you see absolutely in that frozen sample. And this is a piece of work on the left-hand side here by Julia, Julia Mohammed, who is from uh, Embel Heidelberg. And she did this on bacterial um, um, uh, beasts, uh, bacterial cells, some of which had antibiotics and some of which were just growing without antibiotics. And from that, she was able to see the in situ change that the antibiotic made to the ribosome. Now, more of this is happening in um, eukaryotic cells, and a very important thing is coupling this with light microscopy, because very often we want to see very rare events in these cells. And so we need to know where, which bits of the frozen material to put in to the electron microscope and where precisely it is. And to do that, you need a tag across a big volume that you can see where it is. You then focus on that volume, literally carve it out of the ice, and then take that little piece of ice out and, and turn it around. The middle one here is X-ray, uh, high-resolution X-ray imaging. This is a new use of synchrotrons. Um, in which you can get very close to nanometer scale big volume um, data sets. Now, this is particularly good for understanding cellular and subcellular structure, and particularly for complicated cells like neurons. And so you can take a big chunk of mouse brain or a pretty big chunk of Drosophila brain, put it into this. Again, you do this rotation business uh, um, using highly Synchro, um, highly phased and powerful X-rays from a synchrotron, and it allows you to get um, X-ray imaging at about 100 nanometers, and they think that this will come down to 50 or 20 nanometers in the future. So this is a remarkable ability to look at a large amount of biological material at a sort of subcellular uh, resolution. And then the right-hand example here is from Robert Prevedel, um, who is also at Embel uh, Heidelberg, and um, he's a wonderful physicist, and he developed a way of using light as a measurement device. Um, this is called uh, Brulein, Brulein um, microscopy, where you combine sound waves with light. And uh, you may say, why, why on earth do you want to do that? And the reason why is it gives you a measurement of the stiffness. And so when you have sound waves going through a material and you also hit the material with laser light, the frequency of the reflected photons will shift uh, a little bit. They will either pick up energy from the sound wave or they will lose energy into the sound wave, depending on the phase of, of where the light hits and the sound wave hits. Now, from that, uh, you can measure this, this shift in frequency, and that the amount of that shift in frequency on the, uh, from, the, from the main frequency you put in is about the stiffness. So materials which transmit sound well will transfer more energy into the light. Materials that don't transmit well uh, a sound well will not transfer as much energy into the light, and so you won't see so much. And so this is a color map of the zebrafish larvae. You can do this in live biological material without frying the material. And that is one of the key things that Robert achieved was doing this with about a thousand fold less photon flux uh, through the system. And you can see here the developing tail where parts of the tail are much, much stiffer than other parts of the tail during development. So this is measuring a biophysical property uh, from this. So um, the other key technology which has just sort of, again, has been totally necessary for us to process this data and what this meeting is largely about is combining these data sets in clever ways. And this is effectively machine learning, or if you go further back, it's multivariate statistics. 
Um, but in particular, it's also been joined by AI. And I just want to give you my view of how AI is impacting biology. So I would say that there's these two key enablers for um, AI. So one is at scale data engineering. We need to have the data to be able to train um, these crazy big models. And the second thing is something which you know, I'm not involved with at all, but is a key enabler, um, calculus engineering. You need to be able to basically differentiate insanely big mathematical terms. These are put together with the right piece of hardware, and then you can do really exciting things with them. So data engineering is the lifeblood of what we do at EBI. So the human reference human genome and the reference human genome annotation ensemble, um, uh, uh, for example, the reference proteome and the protein sequence and their function in Uniprot, the reference set of protein structures in PDB and the EM structures in EMDB and Empire. All of these things are held by Embol EBI for the use of everybody in the world. We collaborate with colleagues in America and we collaborate with colleagues in Japan to make sure that there is one global database of this. Now this has been a very long-term game. It is still the bedrock which we stand on uh, across this. And if I have one ask of you is to continue to advocate for this type of data engineering to persist. The second thing on the right-hand side is what I mentioned by PyTorch and JAX and TensorFlow and all these other things. Uh, it's not something I, I've, I've done myself, but it's something I, my, myself and my people in my research group use a lot, which is calculus engineering. So this is the ability to write down in relatively succinct ways very, very complex functions, classically, for example, neural networks, not only be able to calculate them, but also to be able to differentiate them. So you can take the differential of that complex function, and now you can do gradient descent. And that is the key feature that underlies all of this uh, deep learning. So how do we use this? So the first way we use this is what I describe as labeling-based deep learning. And for anybody who does image work, this has now become routine. It's certainly routine in my group. On the left-hand side is an example with colleagues in London um, about the human heart. This is where you take images and you label pixels or voxels of, of those images in different ways. And so, I mean, it's basically become routine. It started with cats on the internet. It's now all sorts of biological structures. Um, there are all sorts of different deep learning architectures that allow you to do this. One is where you're very supervised, you provide training data, you really try and recapitulate that generalized model, for example, of the human heart. Another one is where you're less supervised, you can be less supervised. This is work in the middle by Anna Krushek, uh, in this case on developing a ra Arabidopsis um, um, uh, head uh, of classifying cells and clustering those classifications in a semi-supervised way. And on the right-hand side um, is an example of what I would call a labeling task done for Oxford Nanopore. They use deep learning for their base calling, including their modification base calling, um, where they take the signal and the label they're applying here is one of A, T, G, and C when they want to just produce four base pairs, but they can extend that to methyl and hydroxymethyl and other different types. And so they end up uh, casting this as a deep learning uh, problem. But then there's, I think, a much more interesting, well, that is incredibly useful and very interesting. This is a different and, and um, even more interesting uh, use of deep learning, which is where you really try and build something which, for me, produces an output that is not easy to put on the input. So it's not a labeling process. You're not taking a data set and, and sort of labeling it. You're taking a data set and you're transforming it. And one which I'll talk about in more in a moment is AlphaFold. The middle one is one I'm showing here, the work from, I think, from Anshul Kunjai in Stanford um, of predicting how chip seek, um, uh, uh, predicting a chip seek experiment from DNA sequence. But the output of this uh, process, or the, the model of this process, allows you to predict the impact of variation. So you can look at changing the DNA and asking, 
what, of a, what impact would it have on my prediction? And the right-hand example here is jointly modeling um, uh, in situ image, uh, um, uh, um, a tissue um, in situ data and genomic data together for cancer where one can um, uh, come up with a model of what type of cancer cell is going on using both the images and DNA sequence at the same time to inform that model. So a little bit about um, AlphaFold. I think it's a great story, an amazing story when you think about it. So this has been a grand challenge in structural biology since the 1960s. We've known that a DNA sequence, uh, a protein sequence, very often with no other information will fold to a, um, a, a specific three-dimensional structure. Many, many clever people have attempted to solve this over many, many decades. So much so that there's a competition called CASP to assess how well people have attempted to solve this problem. And it has been running for 20 years, and there has been slow progress until this group uh, from DeepMind attacked it. And they attacked it using, in some sense, what is now, in retrospect, the kind of obvious approach, which is deep learning, um, which has um, uh, um, uh, a protein sequence alignment behind it. But then they developed a neural network, and it wasn't a traditional neural network. It wasn't an encoder, an autoencoder, or a UNet, or what have you. They designed a neural network specific to this problem with specific transformations of this problem in specific places. But a really important feature of that was that they were able to write this down as one end-to-end -end process using, uh, no doubt, Google's TensorFlow, but something like PyTorch, so using Google's internal language uh, for this. And therefore, they could do end-to-end -end gradient descent across the entire process when they trained it. This gave the highest prediction accuracy so far, and the head, the leader of that well-organized competition to assess this, said that this had passed John Malt, he's called John Malt, John Malt's predetermined criteria of whether the problem was solved. Of course, these are predictions. They're not solved-solved. They're not everything. They're carbon alphas. They're only the, the stable folds. They're not the intrinsically disordered regions and other things but they absolutely passed the criteria set 20 years ago by John Malt in the CASP competition. Now, uh, at Emble EBI, we've been involved at both ends of these. So firstly, we were involved with uh, colleagues at DeepMind in providing both Uniprot and PDBE and explaining some of the like twiddly fiddly bits of uh, both of those as the data sources. And it must be stressed that DeepMind was only able to do this because of 30 years of structural biology and of storing that information in databases for people to use. And that goes to the importance of, of coordinating this. And then we collaborated them with them, this is Samir Vilenka um, in uh, Embel EBI, in providing an open access database um, of protein structures, and there was a great moment when Demis Hassabis said, well, why don't we just do everything? So indeed, they did everything. Uh, the great thing about having a computational program is it scales incredibly well. It scales in a way that synchrotrons do not scale. And so they were able to run this on every single sequence in UniREF 90, as it were, not in all of Uniprot, because they didn't want to really burn um, or the compute. So I, I um, but I want to now talk about a different use of these mass frameworks. So again, the same idea, we've got data engineering, we've got calculus uh, engineering, and we're gonna come up with a piece of uh, understanding, in this case, prediction, but we're now not gonna use neural networks. We're gonna reposition the core piece of mass, not for this neural network kind of complicated um, linear model or combinations of linear models, but for a classic 1970s 
um, uh, epidemiology approach, which is Cox partial likelihood uh, risk modeling. So this is work done by Alexander Jung and Moritz Gersten um, and uh, Kumar uh, Gusrav in my group. And we're redoing some of this away from cancer, but we first looked at cancer in this wonderful, wonderful data set, which is Denmark. Amazingly, all healthcare across all of Denmark since 1977, which if you have a good research uh, proposal and you have a good rationale for using that data, you can get access to for responsible research. And so we suggested that we could look at cancer across this time period for Denmark and look at all other clinical covariates that could predict whether you have cancer or not. So we took 6.7 million Danes, 100 million different health events, and Alexander was able to reposition the PyTorch scheme to be able to train a multivariate Cox partial likelihood model using every single covariate for each different cancer. We have enough data to train it, and we have the calculus engineering to sort of train it. And this is an example that the main data set comes from Denmark. We used UK Biobank as a test data set, and we were able to derive lots of information. And just stepping through that, um, we've got uh, cases where we can do significantly better than just age and sex. It's actually quite hard to beat just age and sex um, uh, when you do these kind of models. Um, some of this is obvious, so for example, lung cancer is quite predictable and it ends up being all the things associated with smoking. Um, another one is uh, liver cancer, again, well known, and it's to do with alcohol exposure. But there were some less obvious things, and I'll just point out at the bottom here some things which reduce your risk of getting uh, different types of cancer. For example, are uh, uh, changes to the uterus and changes to the other parts of the female reproductive system probably because of interventions uh, when there are diseases of, uh, in those organs. Um, but that was an example where we can see some protective effects. There's a case, in fact, where schizophrenia gives you a protective effect, which is quite odd. Now, there's one business about understanding why the associations uh, give rise to these changes in risk, and that is an important thing to track down, but we can also very practically propose practical uses of this. And in this case, this is about to improve the screening. What's being shown here in the crossed lines are a representation of a standard screening approach for cancer where you would take a particular age and sex cohort and you would screen them, as we do for breast cancer and colon cancer at the moment. And what's being plotted at the bottom in each of these charts, the top one is UK Biobank, the bottom one's Denmark, is the age in which you make those diagnoses. The unhatched, the solid colors, are if we take this prediction-based approach, rerun this, and schedule people for screening when they hit a particular risk level. And so many people would be brought in for screening at a much younger age. And there's two features of this, and so let me just focus on breast cancer. You can see that the, the bar here goes below 55 in age, that means younger people are being brought in for screening. In total, we would predict that this would have, would uh, identify 12% more cases for the same conceptual screening cost. On average, 1.5 years earlier, uh, the cases would have been identified. And 26% of the cases would have been found before the start of the traditional age cutoff. Uh, for this. So a quarter, in this case, a quarter of the cancers would have emerged before 55 years by using this risk-based uh, screening. Now this is retrospective. If you were going to do this, you'd have to do it prospectively. There are many gotchas here, so don't, you know, you can't take this one as, as the truth. But I would stress that in Denmark, it was all of Denmark. And so we don't have an ascertainment bias, which we do have in UK. In UK, if you do this on UK Biobank, you end up discovering that UK Biobank is spookily healthy compared to the rest of the UK. There are many reasons why that is. 
Um, this is not the case in the Danish scenario. So I'm going to skip over this business that we should continue to do this. We should continue to store data. It's 50 years of the PDB has happened. We should continue to propagate this information out in the future. And indeed, we should continue to make things like the EBI work. Again, have some sympathy or some, some feeling for the EBI. I, I make a, an analogy here with electricity. None of us, when we flew to Turkey, did we, or Istanbul, did we say to ourselves, you know, I'd like to ring up the Western Turkish Electricity Board and just check, is there going to be electricity over the, the days for recon? We all made the assumption that there would be electricity here. Whenever you switch on a light, you make the assumption that there's electricity. You don't worry about it. You don't think about it. Uh, and yet, there's an, a massive piece of engineering to allow that light switch to work. In the same way, we don't worry about the human genome. We don't worry about these reference genomes. We don't worry about the cell atlases. We assume that somehow this engineering works, and the grant that we write that says I'm going to be using the human genome in five years' time is absolutely as solid as flying here to Istanbul and switching on a light. Now, that has to be executed by someone, and the people who execute that are the people at Embel EBI in Europe, at NCBI in America, and in a collection of different places in Japan. So this is us, me showing off how important it is, and some of that. And I'm afraid I don't have time to get into really the impact of this on healthcare, um, but just to whiz you through uh, a key thing, um, which is here. This is, I have the privilege of being on the governing board of Genomics England. I'm a non-executive director. This is the UK's health system's whole genome shotgun service for rare disease and cancer. And just to say, there's about 2% of live births um, which have a suspected genetic or, genetic or congenital phenotype where genome sequencing is approved. And on average, a between about 20 to 30 percent of those individuals get a confirmed diagnosis by sequencing their parents and the child. It gets worse if you only have one parent. It differs by different diseases. And just to say, those diagnoses lead to 50 percent hospital visits. If you um, condition on the diagnosis, there's 50% hospital visits of the cohort after diagnosis than before diagnosis. And about 5% of patients have an, a, a large transformative impact on their care. I'm going to come to those. And just for, to give you some sense, every time we improve our methods and we up this percentage, more people will enter the right-hand side of this. More people will have less visits to hospital, and more people will have transformative care. It is incredibly simple, a numbers-based game. It works now, but every single time we make an improvement, it will work better. Um, and just for, just for people to know, those data sets, about 85% or 90% of them, are also consented for research, so you can ask for research access to those data sets. So I just wanted to give you some examples of the transformative care. Probably the one that is, I think, the most amazing is um, RPE65. This is a gene that causes blindness. And this is the first licensed gene therapy in the world. Um, and there's a gene therapy which will insert a good copy of the gene and effectively stop those children going blind. There are 30 children a year that get a diagnosis of a knockout in RPE 65, and they now do not go blind as long as they get scheduled uh, correctly. There are many other diseases that are coming down the line, both with classic gene therapy and gene editing. Sickle cell has gone from an a incurable disease now to a curable disease via genome editing. Um, and so one can imagine stepping through all the sickle cell uh, patients, that's quite a lot of patients, um, uh, through, through this. 
And the middle one is a boy um, who came in, was, was had um, very regular um, uh, trips to the hospital for different infectious diseases. His genome was sequenced and his parents, and they realized that he had a severe immunodeficiency. And it wasn't severe enough that was picked up straight away after the first couple of months, but it was very severe and he was regularly going to hospital. And so he was scheduled for a bone marrow transplant, which uh, cured his condition. So I have whizzed through lots of different things. I've touched on my own research. My research group is here on the left um, um, in lovely, lovely Northumberland. Um, very eclectic and lovely group of people. And I, talked, uh, I touched briefly on the work we did with our collaborators in Denmark. This is the, the Danish challenge grant uh, behind this uh, with Soren Brunak as the lead PI there. So thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you.